Okay, we're going to have the Industrial Revolution, but to have the Industrial Revolution with our farmers, we need a little bit of Lee Greenwood. God bless the USA. To make Tom. If tomorrow all the things were gone, I'd work for all my life. Hopefully you can hear it. Well, I'd have to start again. With just, just my children and my wife. Thank my lucky stars to be living here today. Cause the flag still stands for freedom. And they can't take that away. And I'm proud to be an American. Where at least I know I'm free. Thank you, Thomas Jefferson. We need in those soldiers and yeoman farmers. The mix of country and orchestra music. The American music. God bless the USA. Thanks, Lee Grown. All right, so the farmers are going to be our focus for today, and this is going to be our main thing of looking at how the expansion of the Industrial Revolution is going to affect them, and then they're going to get integrated back into the politics of the time period and trying to figure out exactly what it is that the role they play from going from being the most important people in America, as intended by Thomas Jefferson, the yeoman farmer, the backbone of America, to the less than 2% of the population anymore. But maybe they're still the most important people in America today. At least if you ask a farmer. So this is the evolution of them as a group, both politically, socially, and economically, as the United States goes through the Industrial Revolution, and we become a much more urban nation, at the same time not needing them quite the same as we used to need them all before. And their political power is going to slip during this time. But starting with the actual Louisiana Purchase, thank you, Thomas Jefferson, for that three cents an acre, 1803 Purchase, that's going to give us 15 million acres and open us up like a beautiful little butterfly as a nation. Wait, ooh. You're going to see our expansion of our economic systems. And as we talked about in class, the actual movement is going to go west, west, along those latitudinal lines, so that the actual north that used to be the manufacturing area, because it was so cold, and it's going to be the housing, finance, all the kind of... Um, mercantile types areas is going to expand to the west it's going to go through the steel belt and they're going to still be that way and then the farming area of the middle colonies will expand west and be the farming areas of the middle of america with the grains and the amber waves of grain and all those different things we've talked about like rice and oats and barley and such while well, the rice is really down in the south and then we're going to have the south be in the south doing what it's doing is going to be the area where we're going to continue to have our cash crops Used to be King Tobacco. Then it became King Cotton. It's got a better ring to it than King Tobacco. Way better ring than King Rice or Queen Rice or, or Duke Indigo. But the cash crops of the South are going to be still coming from those warm areas. And this will be our kind of interlocking connectives. And in this era of Dallington Hamilton's protege, handsome Henry Clay. Damn, he's handsome. Handsome Henry Clay, who's going to be working along with his Warhawk buddy, John C. Don't look into his hair and his eyes, Calhoun. But the Whig Party is going to be based on this idea of expanding America's economic evolution and interconnecting it through transportation areas like the roads, the turnpikes, the canals, later on the ro railroads, and the Transcontinental Railroad. And <coughs> in this political party, sorry, my cough is still out there. God damn you, coronavirus. In this time period, we have guys like uh, Abraham Lincoln who is best buddies with his fellow Whig politician in Congress, Alexander Stevens, the future Confederate States of America vice president. So these two guys were best buds, but they were both part of the Whig Party back in 1846, 47, 48, until the Whig Party itself dies. So what we have then is this kind of evolution where the farmers of the South and the West kind of have farming together. They're farmers. They farm alike. They farm like each other, and they have a lot more economically in common than they have in difference. But over time, it becomes pretty obvious that the food farmers of the West are going to have their most important customers in the North. So over time, those two will morph to the point where once we actually get to the actual Civil War, we only talk about the North and the West versus the South. It's just the North, the blue versus the South, the gray. And what's interesting is when the war is over, the North will become more dominant in the Industrial Revolution and the West will be kind of forgotten. It's almost like they're 
not need anymore. Like they've been used by the North. And so the Western farmers will begin to gravitate with the solid yellow dog South as we get in this time period of the 1870s. Now, again, railroads are going to be the big game for farmers and farmers are going to have to learn how to live with the idea that railroads have gotten so measly um, expansive and very, very profitable. But it's also a kind of love-hate relationship because without the railroads, one, you can't get out there unless you're going to take forever. And two, once you actually do your harvesting, you can't sell your food unless you use the railroads. So the railroads become our first big political corporation that kind of start to control the federal government indirectly by buying and helping shape elections and politicians. So the land that they gave away during this time period is massive. They also get us our four time zones, as we talked about before. But in this railroad land grant that's happened, it's important to remember that the railroads are the biggest landowners. They're, they've been given their 100 yards on either side of the railroad and then a checkerboard pattern of square miles, 640 acres, every other up to 10 miles up, 10 miles south, west, east, depending on how the railroad runs. <clears throat> and in some cases, up in the northern railroads, they even get like 40 miles on either side. They've been given a land away that's equal to the land of France and Belgium put together. Now, so if you have this map of Nebraska, for example, good old fast Nebraska, right there in the heart of America, this is a map from 1880. And in this map, you can see on it, it even has the old Sioux Indian reservation, not a reservation, actually, just a territory that they had been given in treaties. And they were all kinds of different chunks in there. If you take a look across here, you're going to see these little areas where these land grants have been given. So the railroad's going to fall along the river, by and large, because rivers tend to go along kind of flat areas, and the railroads need the water. And they'll have been given not only the 100 acres on either side of the railroad, but also the 10 miles off and on. And each one of these little squares on here is basically a square mile. So what you have, if you take a look at some of those sections like this area, is a land grant that's been given to Mr. Holt. I think he might be an orthodontic person over there in Granite Bay area, but he's got his one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And so we have our 64 square miles. And then this territory, in essence, is going to be broken down into smaller stuff. So where you see these big areas, you're going to have an individual specular, land specular, who will turn around and sell these to individual farmers. But all the rest of this is just open up to 160 acres of homestead free ever since 1862. Now remember, a homestead acre is about a football field with the actual end zones cut off real close to it. So during this time, 160 acres again is a very huge chunk of land. It is a massive chunk of land. If it was Granite Bay, you basically have no neighbors around you anywhere within. And it'd still be a long walk and you probably still couldn't find parking after first period. But one way or another, when it came to farming in this time period, you would probably see that these expansive movements have been slowly, as we looked at, kicking Native Americans out. But as this area spills up with these 160 acre farms, the farmers are going to have to do something to make a living, which is farming. So they're going to be farming a lot. So America's productivity of farm based grains, farm based products is going to explode during this time period. So the Industrial Revolution isn't just mass producing widgets and shoes and wagons and like, you know, gasoline engines later on, it's going to be mass producing pretty much everything, including food. So in this expedition we have of expansive growth, we have all these homesteaders with not really much money at all, as we take a look at doing their little exoduster type houses out of sod. Again, you should try it sometime. It's like Lego blocks with mud. And so as they then work, they have their 160 acres for free, which is really kind of cool. The railroads, the way they're going to get their stuff back and forth. And the little towns and cities are going to pop up along that railroad line. Well, let's just take a look at a square, a rectangular section of this, for example. Um, that square mile right up there, the homestead 160 acres is a quarter section. So the actual square mile would be broken up into four quarters, and there'd be four homesteaders on that square mile. And that would be where the guy would be living. And then come harvest time, he'd have to take his produce, his wheat, his corn, his rye, his oats, his barley, his grains, and then take it to market. So in other words, he's got to get his stuff from wherever he was all the way down to the railroad because he's not going to take his stuff straight to New York. He's got to get it to the railroad. So he's going to wait for the railroad to come. He's going to take his stuff down. He'll sell it to the railroad. The railroad will say thank you very much, and they'll go on their merry way and go sell it to New York or Chicago or wherever people want to eat because they have to have the food in the cities because the cities are getting filled up with like skyscrapers and the cities are getting filled up with like bricks and concrete and there's nowhere to farm. So they're going to starve without the farmers. So the farm in the Dell, 
the farm in the dale hi ho the dario the farm in the dale is going to be surrounded by people who all do the exact same thing that they are doing remember we've talked about the idea that the most important element for understanding america's economics is really geography up until the age of electricity and technology being advanced into the computer age like we can do this kind of you know distance learning from wherever i could be in a bunker in alaska i could be down in a beach in florida looking at all the people violating the kind of shelter in place rules i could be anywhere now but back then it pretty much whatever the actual land was it was going to be the thing you did to make money so these farmers are farming whatever will grow in the area so wheat farmers are living next to wheat farmers and corn farmers are living next to corn farmers so when it comes time to sell you really can't sell to your farmers like you can go down and say hey would you like to buy a bushel of wheat and the guy goes funny i was going to ask you if you wanted to buy a bushel of wheat it's like I don't know, man. nobody wants to buy a bushel of wheat seems like they don't have a market so you've got to be able to get it to market and the railroads are going to be the way that you get your stuff from where they are to the people who need it and that is going to be the urban centers. Most on the East Coast, increasingly in their 1900s, will be San Francisco, Seattle, and Portland. A little bit in Texas in the 1930s and 40s after the oil booms. But by and large, most of this time of the 1800s, it's got to get to the East Coast. New York, Boston, Philadelphia, Baltimore, Cleveland, Detroit, where we're making things. So we got our Amber Wave Supreme. It's a wonderful song. You know, the idea of like, ooh, and all that kind of stuff. We've got all kinds of wonderful songs out there. Amber waves of green. Oh, America, America, where the deer and the antelope play. So we have a time period where we've got all kinds of grains being made. It's one of the best places in the world to grow grains. We've got a bunch of adventurous, independent, hardworking farmers going out there who don't want anybody else's help, but they love their independence. <coughs> but come harvest time, it's pretty much harvest time for all of them. It's not like one farmer's going to harvest in October, another farmer's going to ha harvest in December, another harvests like after January. We love to have a big old party with New Year's Eve, and then I do my harvesting. Another farmer's going to wait till Valentine's Day. Harvest is based on Mother Nature, and if you wait too long, your grains dry up too much. You try to harvest too early, and they get all kind of mildewy because they still had a lot of actual moisture in them. So harvest time is a timing thing. That's the name. Harvest time is going to happen, in essence, when it happens. But it's going to happen for people within a region based on their actual temperatures and how much or little water they got that season, pretty much all within a handful of days of each other. And so it's what's going to happen is the farmer's going to literally just glut the market all at one time. And in this kind of game of wheat prices, the price of everything else, like all things, are going to be based on supply and demand, how much of something is there, and how bad do people want your something. And if they want it real bad, the price is going to go up. So since the wheat supply is based on Mother Nature, and you're going to have people demanding food all year long, it's not like they're going to eat in November and then not eat for another four, four, four or five couple of months, the actual eating process, the demand process, is going to be pretty simple across the board, pretty static. So what that means is as we run out of grains of wheat from last year's harvest, the actual price per ton of wheat, Ton, ton of corn, ton of oats or whatever, is going to go skyrocket. These numbers are just picked out the top of my head because they looked good. <clears throat> but by the time we all of a sudden have a harvest and the market is being flooded with all these farmers who want to get money because they get their money basically once a year come harvest time, all of a sudden there's so much in the system that the actual price goes down. So the supply goes up, the price goes down. And then eventually, as it comes down again and people start to use it up and they turn it into bread and they start to run low, the price will go up again. So you have this kind of cycle go up and down and up and down. It's not a very complicated thing to do. So harvest time is really a tough time for farmers. It's an exciting time because it means they're going to get paid pretty soon. But they soon find out that kind of every cloud's got its little silver lining and every silver lining may have a cloud behind it. So you go to market with your big grain and you sit up there. It's nice and cushy, I guess. But one way or another... <coughs> One way or another, you get yourself to actual market, and it could be miles and miles and miles away to get there. You wait for the train to come, and the train comes down the train. And then you ask, how much you willing to pay me for my wheat? And then the train conductor goes, well, New York's only going to buy it for $10 a bushel. So i got to make some money, so $8 a bushel. I have to get 15 just to pay my bills. Screw you! And then the old farmer goes, well, you're lost. Goes the train guy and goes off. Then this guy goes, oh, yeah, rich railroad bastard. I'll sell it to him as its competition, the Northern Pacific, which is like, you know, a whole state and a half away. So he starts his arduous task up to dig it to there, and then the railroad comes in, and he goes, how much you want to pay for my wheat? And the guy goes, New York, I'm going to buy it for $10 a bushel, so I'll buy it for 8 
I have to get 12 just to pay my bills. I screw you. And then the, farmer, the real little guy goes, well, your loss takes off. And the farmer basically is like, damn. Now he doesn't have anybody to sell it to. So this then becomes the foundation of what most farmers get angry about is the monopoly of the railroads. There is no other railroad to sell to because you can't keep going up a state and a half every time you can't get what you want for it. So the railroads are expanding during this time period. They're really getting powerful. Most of this land, again, is being given to them by the federal government, along with sometimes no or very low interest lanes and loans. And do not think that the farmers don't remember where this land came from. It was theirs as part of an American citizen. And then all of a sudden now, it's like I gave just Bezos, as an American citizen, one to 320 some odd million, we gave you tax subsidies to make this huge actual transport facility. And then you're going to get even more billions. Now, where did this come from in the first place? And so a lot of these people are going to get frustrated with this idea that their actual markets over there, it's 2,000 miles away from where I am. I might be getting my grain, but I can't again sell it to some other farmer who also has it as grain. I've got to be able to get it to where it needs to be. So if I all of a sudden went out there and settled and I started being a farmer and he's a farmer, we got to be able to use that transcontinental railroad or one of the transcontinental railroads to get our food to the market. That's how we got to be able to do it. And it's still the same. This is like a nighttime satellite version looking down on America. And you can tell that the mass of America still is living on the coasts. And that big area in the middle is still saying, we don't need to quarantine against this coronavirus. I'm an independent farmer. I got my own 160 acres. Leave me alone. It's sitting there 2,000 miles, 1,000 miles away from where they need to be. So one way or another, we're going to have to find a way to get our stuff to market. And the only way to do that is the railroads. Well, if the railroad is only willing to pay me $8 a bushel for my wheat, and I don't want to be paid $8 a bushel, the railroads come up with a really slick idea. And these are grain silos that are going to be owned by the railroads. And the railroad, in essence, will rent you a storage facility. You can pour your grain in there per ton, and we will, in essence, hold it for you until such time as you were then ready to sell it when it's a better price. So this is the way the railroads can make money on either side of this game. And believe me, the farmers get really frustrated in this idea of paying monthly rent to a railroad that is, they feel, already rich beyond belief. And so as these political cartoons are showing, and you're going to probably get something like this on the AP test, you've got to be able to analyze that here's a Mr. Farmer guy, a Grange guy, getting all angry, and everybody doesn't seem to notice that the big threat to the American people is the railroad, and that they're controlling the Senate, as we've talked about before. In this time period, then, what you have are a bunch of farmers who are not only working their tails off, but they're happy to get a whole lot of help from technology. As we talked about before, they're also part of the technological advances. It used to be that you and your sons would be out there with scythes and sickles and just be hacking away at it. And then all of a sudden, here you got John McCormick coming up with the McCormick Reaper. And by 1834, in 1834, when he first introduced it to everybody, basically, they are literally just cutting by hand. I mean, they're making these little blades by hand. But by the 1870s, these things are being mass produced in these factories and these kind of molds that they're using. So they also are getting better at making everything. So at the time period, you're going to start to slowly but surely see that all production goes up, not just in the cities, but also in our farming communities. <coughs> so they get these tractors and all of a sudden the tractor allows you to actually farm a whole lot more efficiently with a whole lot more success. But the tractors don't come for nothing. You're going to have to go buy the tractors. You're going to have to go buy the cold chilled seal plows by um, Mr. Oliver. And these things are going to help you become more efficient, more productive as a farmer. But they're going to put you in debt in order to get there. To make money, you got to go in debt. Seems like for the farmers, at least in this time period. And all along the time, uh, guys like Andrew Carnegie are going to be making money. So here then, all of a sudden, we got our little homestead again. We got our actual 160 acres. And most farmers, when they're working with their families, are not going to be necessarily farming the entire 160 acres. It, it's just uh, almost impossible. I mean, can you imagine going out in that entire area and trying to, you know, fertilize and plow and harvest? So they would farm maybe 10, 15, 20 acres, depending on how big their farm was. And so they could use the rest of it to like feed their horses. The horses could roam around with the deer and the antelope, playing all as much as they want to, and sometimes going over other people's lands. But little by little, if you buy a tractor all of a sudden, it's like, woohoo, now you can farm a lot more, which means I don't need as many horses anymore. Which this horse would probably go, in, what the hell's happened to my two horse friends? I don't see them anymore. What's that smell of glue? I wonder where I they went. Why am I the only one here? This, in essence, is going to put farmers under a ton of debt. But it's okay. That's not horrible as long as you can pay it off the next time around. So what you find then is farmers start getting themselves stuck 
in what we're going to call a vicious spiral. So follow me on this. 1878, just hypothetically, let's say you've got 40 acres of your 160 that you're farming. You got a lot of suns, you're out there working your tail off, and you harvest 10 tons of wheat. Let's just say hypothetically. And nationwide, because it's a nation that's buying your wheat, it's not one guy like Nick of Nations, but basically this is going to be sold nationwide. So let's say that's $100 a ton. So you make a gross profit of about $1,000. So you take your 10 you know, times by 100, you got 1,000 gross profit. Now it costs to basically live. You know, you got to buy your clothes, you got to buy your sod, you got to buy your sod cutters, you got to buy your windows for your sod house every once in a while, and you got to buy the things you need, the sickles and all that stuff. So let's say <coughs> it's going to be $980. Let's just say. Right, um, you made twenty dollars profit, which doesn't sound like a lot now, but it multiplied by about fifty back then. So you you know you paid all your bills, and you made what thousand dollars for the bank. That's eh, okay, but you're doing well and producing well, and so are the farmers to your left and to your right, to your north, to your south, and all the wheat farmers around you are doing well, and they're all buying the same kind of a more efficient technology. They're getting the cold chilled steel plow. They're getting the McCormick Reaper. After a while. It seems like everybody's making a little bit more and harvesting a little bit more. So let's say, for example, we made 50 acres and the acre is the acre. It can only produce so much wheat pretty much no matter what you do until the days of high tech fertilizing. Thank you, UC Davis, and all the things that are coming out of modern investing and um, experimentation. But this time period, pretty much an acre is going to grow so much wheat. So I do 50 acres, 13 tons, but so are my neighbors. So there's an oversupply of wheat. So the demand is pretty much the same. It might be going up a little bit with the population, but by and large, all of a sudden we start noticing you can only get $75 a ton. So our gross prof profit is 975. Our costs have gone up a little bit because we're now doing more acres. We've got more stuff going. So all of a sudden now we're like $45 in debt. <coughs> That's okay. Most Americans are in debt all the time. The country's in debt. We just added another 2.2 trillion. Being in debt's not a horrible thing long as you can pay off your payments on the debt. That's the big kicker. So let's say all of a sudden 1880 comes rolling around and you decide, you know what, screw it. I'm going to have to just bite the bullet. I'm going to have to buy myself one of those tractors. And now I'm going to be able to kind of harvest a whole lot more land. I'll be able to do a lot more work with my sons. We won't need to have all that land left over. But now I'm $495 in debt. But that's okay because now I can har farm 140 acres for 35 tons of wheat, but then some of my neighbors, they bought a tractor too, so we're all getting more productive. So now we're really glutting the market with way, way too much wheat. And so now it's down $40 an acre, so I've got 1400 gross profit, but my cost because of my payments on my tractor and my farm and all this other stuff, next thing you know, I'm now in a mountain of debt. This is where the problem happens for farmers. It is, in essence, a vicious downward spiral. That's what we're going to call it. A vicious downward spiral, in essence, is going to just like a black hole, slowly but surely, the harder you work, the worse it gets because you produce more and more. So these farmers of America in the 1870s, 80s, and 90s find themselves going from being like the backbone of America, Thomas Jefferson's yeoman farmer, to being the people that are kind of slowly forgotten. And here, then, is the reality. You have to be able to verbalize. The harder farmers work, the worse it gets for them because they overproduce the price of the things they produce. They grow drops. The amount of money they make goes down. So in order to pay off my bills and my credit and my debt from last year, I'm going to have to actually farm even more next year. And in doing so, the price will drop again because me and my other farmers are all doing the same thing. And so farmers are incredibly independent people. They farm like nobody's business. They work their tails to the bone way harder than most Americans work outside of farming. But the harder they work, the worse it gets. Down, 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 down. That's our downward spiral. So the farmers in the 1870s, 1880s started forming alliances. Farmers Alliance, they call. They're also called the Grange. A lot of, around a lot of parts in America, you can find a Grange Hall. <laughs> It'll be like the local meeting place where everyone kind of gets together and hangs out and has weddings and dances and that kind of stuff. So the Grange, in essence, is going to be an evolution that happens in this time period of the great kind of industrial expansion following the Civil War. It's going to go through for 100 years, a little stamp there. The Farmers Alliance is the hot picnics and slick meeting bees and little kind of that kind of stuff. And in the midst of this, then, they will get together and try to work as one. Now, if you take a look on this little kind of farmer's little flag over here, the most good for the most people, wisdom, this, look at the bottom. They want free trade. Now, that doesn't mean free trade. That means 
no tariffs because tariffs, as we're going to focus on here a little bit, tend to just really screw over farmers because we are, in essence, slowly but surely feeding the world. We're overproducing to the point where we need, farmers need, outside markets to keep the price of their products high enough that they can get enough money to pay off the bills from last year. So farmers are going to be the big supporters of the idea of not just free trade, but also something called bimetallism. All right, so this one's a little complicated. I can do it easier when I'm in class because I can show you my own personal roles, and I've been told I can't do that on, on these. Anyway, so let's imagine that blood is money. Let's just say blood is money. And you need a perfect ratio of blood per unit's body mass. Now, I know this may come as a shock, but you have more blood in you right now than you did when you were born, unless you were the squishiest baby ever. So as you have grown, your body's adapted and has upped the amount of blood. It's got to have a perfect ratio. You need to have the perfect amount of blood. Too little blood and you start getting all sleepy. Next thing you know, you're <laughs> too much blood and you get hypertension. And then things start just bursting. So the perfect baby bear porridge is one to one blood to your actual body mass. <clears throat> now, in the world then of societies, and economics on a national level, let's just say the ratio is the same, but it's got a little bit different twist to it. We, in essence, are going to have one unit of population to one unit of gold to one unit of paper money because gold is hard to carry around. Now, there's been gold as a medium for exchange called specie. It's like special stuff, and it's been there for a very long time. But gold is hard to carry around. You see Tyron Lannister and stuff. These guys, you know, gold coins, they can get really tough. They got to have whole wagon fulls of gold. So what societies have come up for a long time is like little pieces of paper, bills that basically are bonds. They're something that promises that if I turn this into you, you can then give me a piece of gold or as much as gold is worth of this thing. Think of the continental bills of the Revolutionary War time period. So these bills are easier to transport. But... You can't have the bills out of whack ratio-wise with the amount of gold out there. Because if you have too many bills out there and you don't have enough gold, if four people with $100 bills want $100 of gold and the bank has said, hmm, whenever you bring this piece of money in, you can have $100 worth of gold, but they've given four of those out and the four people come back to the bank all at the same time. They go, give me my gold. The bank's going to be like, hmm. I can only give you $25 of gold because now we have inflation. So if you get out of whack between the gold number there and the green number there, then we have inflation. <coughs> and inflation is not always a good thing. Sometimes it's good, but it depends. So the bills are out there based on what a government produces. So the problem with having a gold standard function of money in your society, because it's rare and everyone agrees that it's important, is that you can't find gold a natural thing deep in the earth at the same rate as your population grows. I mean, if you're lucky, you can keep it close, but generally it doesn't work that easily. So we have boatloads of immigrants coming to the country, having been told they can get 160 acres. All they got to do is get here. And so they come looking for land. Our population explodes. We have jobs in the actual cities because of the Industrial Revolution. But gold is being found out in Nevada and California and Utah and Idaho and different places only as fast as people can find it. It's not like Mother Nature just opens up and says there's more over there. Those rainbows don't have that pot at the end of them always. I've looked. So we start having, in essence, more body mass than we have blood in our system. Now, if you don't have enough blood in your body, you could die. So... If you are really on the verge of death, you'd probably be willing to pay a lot for blood. So look at it this way. The out of whack this gets, the more out of whack, the more important the gold gets. Meaning, if I'm someone with a lot of gold, let's imagine Andrew Carnegie. Let's imagine John D. Rockefeller. Let's imagine J.P. Morgan. Banks make their money by loaning out money to other people. And the more desperate they are for your blood, the more willing to pay you high interest rates. So the more out of whack that number with the six gets from the number of the actual amount of gold, the more interest goes up, the more money people can make because people are more desperate for money. 
If you were on the verge of dying, you would probably be willing to pay all kinds of money to get a bag of blood. If you're doing fine, if the race is perfect, if the race is right there, one to one to one, why would I pay you for a bag of blood? I mean, it might be cool on Halloween, but by and large, I don't need it. So the same supply and demand laws apply. So as we grow as a nation in this time period and the population changes, what starts happening is we start seeing the actual value of gold go up. <coughs> so what you're going to have are farmers and many others, but farmers especially, starting to demand that more and more and more greenbacks be printed. In other words, we need to inflate things because right now, if I'm a farmer and I want to go out and borrow money for a plow or a tractor, the interest rates have gone from 5% to 10 to 15 to 20% because the people with money, the banks and the rich guys who don't have so much money, you can just put it in a bank and let it be loaned out for them. These guys have no problem. These guys are going to be called gold bugs. The greenback people are going to be called greenbackers. And what they want is for the federal government to start printing out more and more money to, in essence, make it easier to get interest. And it's going to inflate the price of things. And we'll see how this works here in a second. <coughs> so in between all this are the gold people and the greenback people are the silver people. And these are the free silver people. As this political cartoon shows you, they, in essence, want the government to focus on making money based on silver, not gold, because gold is way more rare and silver is easier to find, which is why it's not as expensive as gold. And they want to have more of it out there. Amazingly enough, a lot of the people who are pushing for the free silver movement, meaning the government to actually make coins based on silver, actual official U.S. tender made on silver as opposed to gold, happen to be the silver miners because that then drives the price of silver up, which means I'm going to make a lot more money as a silver miner. Well, then you have guys like Grover Cleveland. We'll be talking about him in another lecture here in just a little bit. And he, in essence, has there at his little kind of side, the idea of a sound money policy. That means the gold standard. And he's going to try to chop off the many-headed hydra of the free silver movement. Again, many of these guys being the farmers and the miners of the West. So these two political cartoons have a gold sound money night over here, basically defending a much bigger, much more popular, much more populist, meaning there are more people in the country who want the silver system. And he is defending the rights of smart people, you know, bankers and rich guys. Over here, you have basically Uncle Sam standing with his votes, Billy Club, keeping people out of the White House. He must be kept out, the cartoon says. And here you got this little vagabond guy kind of coming in. He's like a little Jacob Cox we're going to talk about in a little while. He's got a ruffled up hat, and he's got his free silver. It's like, come on. And you can see him over here, and he's carrying his arm. These like populism, these dishonest money schemes. In other words, we're just going to make paper money all over the place, but we're not going to make paper. We're going to make silver money all over the place. So the guys who want the government to basically continue to make money based on gold only are the gold standard people. We call them gold bucks. The people who say, you know what, there's just not enough gold for how big our society and our economy is getting. We need to have other things. So why don't we just go to the silver? These are called silverites. Most of America in the time period are starting to think of this as being, why can't we have both? And this is called bimetallism. So if we can't find enough gold because the population is growing faster, imagine again a body becoming a huge, big body, like a big, massive, I need to draw blood for that kind of a body, but you can't find enough gold, i.e. blood. So next thing you know, I'm going to make, and our economy can't do what it's doing, let's pump in some silver, some plasma. So 16 to 1 becomes the ratio that they start to throw out as our option. Now, the real crazy people come from the bottom of society, coming from the bottom of the people, the populace, the green, kind of grassroots society kind of thing are going to be called the Greenback Party. And the Greenback Party is saying, we need to have stuff printed. We just need to have money printed. We do this during the national emergencies, and we need it, we need it, we need it. We had it during the Civil War. We had it during the American Revolutionary War. When we have these needs, we need to have this kind of money. We, gotta, we can't have people not having modes of transportation or economics. We've got to have me mediums of transfer. So here you have a little click color cartoon of Uncle Sam with his hat off, doing this little inflationary kind of like money bag guy, kind of like, the, like he's gotten that and he's trying to talk all these guys in politics into voting for him. So the money schemes are seen to be a way to inflate the economy. Now, here's why inflation is good. <clears throat> inflation is basically bad for people that have a lot of money and have a lot of people who owe them a lot of money. So here, just follow me on this. Let's imagine that as a farming family, you scraped and pinched and pennied your way to 
buying $5,000 worth of tractor equipment, um, extra land or whatever, and you don't have any money. You don't even have a husband in there. You just got your four boys. You're waiting for them to grow up so you can do some farming. But you owe it at 7% interest. That is locked. Now, all of a sudden, we start printing out greenbacks. The government just starts going, woohoo, and starts printing out money all over the place. And inflation goes up 1,000%, meaning something cost a dollar today would go up 10 times. 100% would be doubling, right? So a dollar would go to two. So basically, inflation at 10%, meaning a dollar today would be $10 worth in a little while. So it's going to go up, right? It's not $1 goes to $1,000. But notice this. Even though your income may not keep pace, and that's the downside of inflation, as things get more expensive, your wages are usually lagging behind it. But <coughs> if you're deep in death <coughs> or you have a smoker's cough, then I have to really stop smoking these. But they're so... Maybe it's vaping. I have to give up vaping. Let that be a lesson to you. Stop vaping, America. Don't do it. You'll cough like me. The money you owe for 30 years or 10 years or 5 years is locked at the interest rate that you took it out at. So... Functionally, this means that over time, if you owed $5,000, just think Germany during the hyperinflation time period, and the amount of money you owed to the bank is locked at 7%, after a couple of years, functionally, it would be as if you owed $50. And you could basically go, here, bank, I'd like to pay off my tractor mortgage and my loan on the house, loan on the actual land. You just drop a little $100 bill in there and you kind of go, uh, keep the change. Now, farmers then, who are deep in debt, want inflation. Farmers want inflation because it basically lowers the value of the American dollar, which means other countries around the world would like to buy our stuff because our stuff is cheap, because our dollar is weak compared to their medium of money. So next thing you know, we all of a sudden start having farmers selling a lot more wheat, a lot more corn, a lot more cotton around the world. So farmers want greenbacks because it helps them in this process. Now, as this chart we looked at before in class has the actual percentage of Americans doing work in agriculture, goes from like 90% down to when we do our first census in 1790, and then as we get more and more technology, we need fewer and fewer people to actually farm. Well, at the same time, if you did those who basically kind of work for a living, you know, in the industry, and technology is going up and up and up. What we end up having is this weird kind of moment in time where as farmers are a percentage of the population, now this, to me this makes total sense. No wonder in 1800, which is right there, you have Thomas Jefferson going, yeoman farmers are the backbone of America. Because if you get 80% or 85% of the country to think that you're the backbone of America, you're probably going to win a lot of elections, which we'll take a look at in another lecture here. But if you notice, as fewer and fewer people are farming as a way of life, you get to a point where it's all of a sudden, right around 1892, presidential election year, um, that farmers are less than 50% of the population. All you got to do to win an election is win 50% plus one more vote of the Electoral College. So if fewer and fewer people are farmers, then that means politicians are listening to farmers less and less over time. So, right during the Second Industrial Revolution, what you start to then have are the people that are becoming more important are the actual workers in the factories that are around 50% too. Remember, we've talked about the Republican Party is going to, when it decides to, for the corrupt bargain number two in 1877, turn its back on freed men of the South and leave them to their own devices until the Civil Rights Movement in the 1950s and 60s, they then turn to big business. And they become the kind of supporters of the expansion of business with high tariffs and things like that. And they, in essence, will start to advocate, would be a great way of saying, speak for, vote for the factory owners and the workers in factories, meaning those guys. Now, over time, these factory workers are going to be replaced by automation. So they're going to be needed less and less. Technology goes up and up and up, but the factory workers are going to be needed less and less. And so you're going to see the heyday of America's kind of unions in, in the country is when we still just aren't using robotic technology yet very much, right, 1950s, 60s, early 70s. But as we don't need workers as much, they then suffer the same fate with this blue line going down that farmers suffered in 1892. And it's not... 
by accident in 1892, the Republican Party, trying to please workers and the factory owners who own the factories the workers work in, find themselves in a sticky situation. And that is the 1892 Homestead Strike with Andrew Carnegie and Henry Clay. I'm not joking. That was his, nick that was his name, Frick. And so Henry Clay Frick is going to come along, along with Andrew Carnegie, and they are going to push the actual union in the Homestead, Pennsylvania steel plant to the breaking point. And it'll end up becoming a nationwide strike um, led with these Pinkerton guys that are going to be beating up people and shooting at guys. And so there becomes literally a firefight out there on like July 6th, 1892, right after the 4th of July celebration. And the workers end up winning. But then the actual government calls in the National Guard, and then later on some actual uh, strikes break out across the United States. So the Republican Party in 1892 in the summer, remember this is the entire time period when things get crazy, so then summer going in the fall of an election year, they have to pick a side. So when they call out the troops, they pick the side of Andrew Carnegie and the rich guys. And the Democratic Party goes like, perfect, and they begin to look at actually advocating picking up the pissed off union workers in these actual industries. So in 1882, the Democratic Party leaps in, grabs these workers that the Republican Party has been advocating for for the better part of about 30 years, and then end up taking their side. Now, we in America tend to think that the two parties are in poor opposites of each other. And that's kind of anytime you turn on CNN or Fox. But in reality, they're really not that far apart. The Republican Party and the Democratic Party, despite what you hear on Fox, despite what you hear on MSNBC, they're really pretty close gradations. The edges of the thing are more like fascism and communism, you know, out there on the edges. So the American farmer finds itself stuck in the 1890s with two parties that don't seem to really care about him anymore. The solid South is the party of the Democratic Party, and then in the North, they're the party of Boss Tweed and the immigrants coming from Ireland and then Italy and different places. And then the Republican Party is the party of big business, the railroads, and the workers in the factories. And they're the party of high tariffs. And it seems like if you're a farmer, no one gives a crap about us. Yet we feed you all, as this cartoon shows you. So in this time period of 1892, we end up having a brand new party born into America. We've always had third parties. Remember the Know Nothing Party and the Free Soil Party? We've got all kinds of party parties. But a new one comes along, and it's called the People's Party. You can see it right over here. The People's Party is going to be born in 1891, and I got a sneeze coming. <laughs> I swear, this is just hay fever season. This has nothing to do with my quarantine in this little room that I've not been able to leave for three weeks. The People's Party is born based in Omaha, Nebraska, in this time period, and they're going to be a party that says, screw the Republicans, screw the Democrats, no one seems to talk for us. And as this little people party, a little balloon shows you, it's a kind of an alliance of all these different people, the Alliance, Farmers Alliance, the Greenback Party, we need paper money, the Knights of Labor, they're kind of on the edge of dying, the Old Granger Party, the Silver Party, the Prohibition Party, it's like anybody who's got some sort of beef against the federal government, the two parties, come join our party, and we'll be this, this platform of lunacy, as it says on this little cartoon. They're flying high on hot air. And it doesn't seem to be holding very well. So it's got these little kind of breaks in the People's Party. Contradictions within itself. The People's Party, we know historically as the populist. So you need to know it as the populist party. So in 1892, they actually have their guy, Weaver, um, run for president in 1892. Um, Cleveland's going to win. But in 1888, he had lost. But in 1892, he wins. Look at that. Four states went for a third party. This has not happened in a long time. So if you're the Democrats or Republicans, you start going, oh, crap. Maybe farmers are not 50% plus of America anymore. Maybe they're not the 85% when Thomas Jefferson called them the yeoman farmer backbone of America. But they're still a pretty big chunk, and they're pretty pissed. And so maybe, just maybe, we're going to have to start doing something to help them out. So what you have in 1893 is even though George, um, I mean, yeah, Grover Cleveland, George Cleveland, George Cleveland, his brother, no one ever talks about him. No, I don't even know if he had a brother. Anyways, Grover Cleveland is president in 1892, and then almost within a year, the economy just collapses in the worst economic downturn we had ever had up that time period, and everything starts to fall apart, and he loses both houses of Congress, as you can tell right there. So he's pretty much dead in the water, and it's in this time period of 1894, um, in the midst of this worst, deepest crisis we ever had, that you have a new phenomenon called a march on Washington, and it's called the Coxey's Army of 1894. Unemployed people come 
flooding into Washington, D.C., rallied by a guy named Jacob Coxey, to basically demand that the federal government act for the American people. Do something for us when the economy is crapped out. We need your help. We need masks and we need protective equipment or whatever. We, in essence, have this big movement. And what Jacob Coxey wants, in essence, is the federal government to pay unemployed people to build more roads, more railroads, so we can have an even more efficient system. And eventually, he wants to give a speech in front of Congress. They won't let him. He and his followers get arrested. I'm not joking for walking on the grass. And so being not able to pay their phrase, the whole Jacob Coxey army thing kind of fades out. But this, if you want to reference it, if you ever get into writing about the civil rights movement or anything like that, this is our first March on Washington. Unemployed people from the country basically marching to Grover Cleveland saying, you and Congress are here for us. We need help. You need to help us survive. And the response in this age of Horatio Alger, rags to riches, social Darwinism, survival of the fittest, is that it's not the government's job to help you at all. You're on your own. If you're poor, it's your fault. Or maybe your genetics. Or maybe your morals. Or maybe all of those things. You need to do it on your own. So this March on Washington is our first, and it was not very successful, as many March on Washingtons are often very interesting, but they often don't change much. But the actual farmers themselves will continue to kind of feel like society hasn't listened to them. <coughs> Frank Baum, in, in 1890, writes a book called The Wizard of Oz. And in The Wizard of Oz, you have a basic story that is kind of an allegory of sorts. Now, there's all kinds of controversy on whether or not Frank Baum actually did this for this reason, or did he just kind of subconsciously think of these parallels? Or like anybody who actually comes and looks for deeper meanings and things, think of any English class you've ever been, sometimes coming up, what was the reason that they chose the color of mauve, or whatever. The idea is of Dorothy of Kansas, farming center of America, the bleeding Kansas that fought for freedom more than anybody else at first, and then the scarecrow, Cowardly the Lion, and the Tin Woodsman. And they're all trying to find their way to the Emerald City. Now, theoretically, this is the allegory that has got people thinking about stuff. Kansas, home of America's farmers, at least the center of America, the heart of America, all of a sudden gets hit by a natural disaster, which they can't do anything. The big tornado comes and lifts Dorothy's house up into the air and drops it in the land of Oz. And then when she finds herself in the land of Oz, she ends up being told that the way to get back home is you've got to go talk to the wizard. You've got to go down the Yellow Brick Road. So she's met by these little leprechaun, little putians kind of people, and these are supposed to be the everyday people, the everyday common people, and they want the best of what's out there. And they actually have a little lollipop guild. A guild, in essence, is a union. And so we represent the, the lollipop guild, and now they're doing their thing, dancing. Have you ever seen them, Wizard of Oz? That was a pretty close song. Anyways, these guys are representative of the people who are working for the betterment of everyday small people, the everyday common man, through labor unions and such. But they've got the Wicked Witch of the West and the Wicked Witch of the East. In other words, the Union Pacific Railroad and the Center Pacific Railroad or the Center Pacific Railroad from your angle and the Union Pacific Railroad. These are the railroads that are screwing us, the everyday common people farmers. In other words, they keep telling us they won't pay us for our bushels of wheat and we can't do anything without their help. And so this house <laughs> went down and collapsed on one of them, the Wicked Witch of the East. And her ruby slippers are right there. And the ruby slippers are going to get you home. Well, the ruby slippers aren't the ruby. So the Wicked Witch of the West comes and she goes what happened to my sister and she's like i'll get you my pretty and then linda the good witch of the north that theoretically meant a lot of different things um the cool winds of the north would come down and make it rain so that was one of the ideas and she comes down like in a little bubble of rain or whatever um other people think that maybe it's just the workers and the farmers of the north that are going to come down and help us or maybe the north of the union but she ends up going along and trying to help find a way to get down to Oz. And she's got to walk on the yellow brick road. The gold standard will take you to the emerald city of Greenbacks. That's where salvation lies. So you're going to have to use the reality of today, the gold standard, to get to the better of tomorrow, the emerald city of Greenbacks. And so she goes marching along, and she bumps into the scarecrow in a farmer so that's a farmer and he has no brain in other words farmers if you would simply stop overproducing the cities will starve to death and they will pay you anything for your produce you are your own worst enemy think it through farmers she then goes to the tin woodsman and in essence that represents factory workers and factory workers are in essence their own worst enemy because they have no heart so every time a union goes on strike some other factory worker who's out of work goes like hmm, i'll be a scab i'll work in that area in other words i will take the other guy's job meaning i have no heart for my fellow worker <coughs> and then finally the cowardly lion 
which is supposed to represent these politicians that are all talk, roar, and they all sound great until like a little dog goes, eh, and then they like, eh, and they run away from a rich person. So you in essence have politicians, the factory workers of the North, and then the farmers of the rest of America, and they're trying to get to the Emerald City. And along the way, the Wicked Witch of the West, she kind of goes, ah, and she sends her little monkeys to go fly. And they land in a, um, and they go walking through these poppies, which is supposed to be symbolic of opium, which a lot of the Chinese workers would use. And so the idea was that these monkeys are kind of like the Chinese workers that come along and kind of like hurt the rest of our day America. So eventually they use water to kill the wicked witch of the West. And water is the thing that farmers need in the 1880s, 1890s. If you remember reading about the droughts. And so all of a sudden they make it to the actual Emerald City. They tell the Wizard of Oz that we've killed off the evil, evil, horrible witch. And he in essence says, well, I need to go do other things now. And they're in essence being used again. That is symbolic of politicians kind of saying, I promise to do this if you just vote for me. And then they come back, I promise to do that if you vote for me again. And then eventually the politician behind the whole thing is going to be the action professor. And like, don't look behind that man in the curtain, that kind of stuff. And then eventually what happens is he in essence says to them, you have always had the ability to get back home, in other words, make a more perfect union, you have always had the ability to have a better life, you just need to believe in yourselves. And he in essence tells the cowardly lion that you've got more bravery than you know. Go out and just stick to it. Do what you need to do. Tells the Tin Woodsman, oops, sorry, behind the Tin Woodsman, that you've always had a heart. Gives him a little stopwatch so he can hear it kind of stuff. He says it's always been there. And then he in essence tells the Scarecrow that you, in essence, are smarter than you think. Gives him like a signal code loudy kind of a thing. In other words, you guys already have the means at your disposal to make a better life. Factory workers, join a union. Sooner or later, the factory owner is going to have to hire you guys. Farmers, stop overproducing. Politicians, just live to your promises, promise made, promise kept, and the people will vote you back. Don't be worried about the big rich guys. There's more people on election day of the poor people. And in essence, he then tells Dorothy, you have always had the ability to get back home. You just need to use these ruby slippers and go click, click, click. Now, in 1939, when The Wizard of Oz was made, the ruby slippers were ruby because the red popped on the big screen. This is one of the first colored movies. In the story, uh, her ruby slippers are actually silk. Allegory meaning, you can walk on the gold standard, but don't think that the Emerald City is going to be your salvation. Your salvation lies in a bimetallism, 16 ounces of silver to every ounce of gold, that will make America healthy again. So the Wizard of Oz, in essence, is going to be part of the story of farmers desperately trying to find their way out of this vicious cycle that they keep getting themselves down, this spiral down, down, down. So over here, the political cartoon of this laborer and the farmer, they got under mounting debt. Here lies prosperity, enslaved in 1863, stabbed in the back in 1873, and assassinated in 1893 by John Sherman, who came out with the silver stand thing, Grover Cleveland, other traitors in Congress. Now, this cartoon over here shows that farmers don't want communism but they do want someone to speak up for them. So the election of 1896 is going to be this high point where the farmers finally have people listening to them. And that guy that's listening to them is going to be William Jennings Bryan, the Democratic candidate who's going to go out and say, you cannot crucify mankind on this cross of gold. And it's going to be seen as this populist movement. And that it's going to be the cartoon is going to make fun of the idea that the Democratic Party is going to be swallowed up by this everyday commoner, the common man, the uh, guy that can speak for everyday people, but he doesn't understand anything. In other words, if we actually start using silver, we're going to destroy the economy. So say the rich people and the bankers. And so the idea of the Democratic Party being swallowed up. But in reality, this cartoon, if you ever get this one, it's been on the AP test quite a bit off and on. The interesting part about this is William Jennings Bryan as a Democratic candidate for the Democratic Party, they swallow up the Populist Party. The Populist Party, in essence, instead of running their own candidate in 1896, just decides, eh, at least the Democrats are talking about coining silver 16 to 1. So they throw their weight behind William Jennings Bryan and the actual populist party, it should be that balloon, is swallowed up by the Democratic Party. And that is, in essence, what happens. All right, so the farmers are a little frustrated, a little frustrated that no one seems to care about what's going on with them. And their last big hurrah, trying to actually come up with recall and initiatives, and all kinds of different changes we'll talk about in a while. 1896. Party in 1891. Runs the candidate in 1892, dead in the water by 1896. Thus goes the way of most third parties in America. All right, guys, hang in there. Talk to you in a while. Whee!